Hello and welcome again to this special three-part series. My name is Dr. Lisa Cherry and this is the Trauma Resonance Resilience podcast and hopefully you've had a chance to listen to part one, um, Finding the Beauty in Cancer with uh, the wonderful Nikki Leader who is joining me again today for part two and part two well, how did we get to part two? Well, I'll, I'll bring Nikki in actually, but so hi, Nikki. Hi, how are you today? <laughs> I'm great. It's so good to be doing this with you again. Yeah, um, likewise. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think today we're going to be really looking at nurturing and navigating um, cancer. Um but what was really interesting, because we had a really kind of bouncy, happy, jolly kind of conversation about cancer. And we had a chat about that the next day, about how confronting that actually might be for listeners who were not feeling bouncy yeah. that day. Yeah. And And I guess that's the beauty of doing three parts, isn't it? Because we can look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of this yeah. experience. Yeah. So what kind of came up for you afterwards? What was... Yeah, it was fascinating, actually, what came up for me afterwards, because when I reread the title, and by the way, thank you for putting it all out there, Lisa's a star and all this stuff, um, I became really... Oh, OK. And obviously, this is my stuff. I own everything I'm going to say around the subject of cancer because everybody has completely their own situation and journey and treatment and everything. It's unique. And for me, what came up was thinking about the beauty in cancer and reading that title. I kind of put myself I suppose this is the empathetic side. I put myself in some other people's shoes and which is not really my role to do that but I did it's where I went and it was wow you know there are so many people who've lost friends through cancer who have a really tough time managing it and we all do it in different ways our coping mechanisms but I wanted to I asked you if you would change the title to Finding the Beauty, because for me, it really symbolized where I've come from, from being this bouncy, energetic, full-time work, crazy busy, about to be a granny, everything was wonderful. And then boom, the, the diagnosis came and I realized that everything had changed. And as much as I wanted to comment a little bit on about when I said um, it was like an adventure, just for the record, I, I do really see life as an adventure. And for me, I've had big chapters and um, that have been triggered by something like this. And they have always, you know, come out with such enormous change and growing and good stuff that I do tend to immediately go there with that when anything like this happens and say, OK, let's we'll unravel it, of course, and we'll acknowledge everything. But. There was, I did watch something on YouTube about a woman who'd, you know, recovered from stage four, did a lot of law of attraction work. And she was talking about being a CEO of your health. You know, well-being is now a business. And she was talking about really becoming a CEO of your health. And I think talking about navigating cancer, I think it is a journey which is going to ebb and flow. It's going to be sometimes like a roller coaster. Sometimes it'll just stand still because you're too blooming tired to do anything else. Um, but we figure it out. Mm. We do figure it out. And that is the enormous trust and belief I have in the human nature, is that we will figure it out. Yeah. And, you know, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because I also have a tendency to be irritatingly positive about mm -hmm. the darkest aspects of life. And, you know, that's not for everybody, but that is who I am. And yeah. my new hashtag is, this is me, you know, it's, um, yeah. I, there are aspects of this process and diagnosis that I will not be sharing. Mm. And we are all like that. And it's really important, I think, 
that there is an understanding that there are, you know, I'm happy to share what I've processed, like the really, really awful traumatizing aspect of diagnosis because I've processed it. But I'm about to have a stem cell transplant and it's quite possible that that's going to be pretty disgusting. And I'm not going to be talking about how disgusting that is until I've come out the other side. I like to share lived experiences about something, not living. You know, if I'm in something and I'm processing it, that's stuff that I do privately. So I think I think that's really an important caveat about any conversation that you're listening to and any conversation that that you're listening to with me and Nikki and any conversations that you listen to from other people, people share generally what they're comfortable with and what they've processed and they bring themselves. And clearly both me and you have a particular view of the world that has that, you know, let's look at the positive side of things. And that's, I know that can be confronting for people sometimes um and i know that some people that's the only thing they talk about and i guess by doing three parts we wanted to kind of explore all of it and i know in part three we're going to go into a bit more darkness you know we're gonna look at endings and beginnings um but today i guess what's really hopeful is that we can talk about some of the self-care practices and collective care practices I like to talk about because it's not just about what we do for ourselves, but actually how we make healing collaborative and work together um, to create healing and healing spaces. Um, so I am not really in a big healing space right now. I'm entrenched in the medical model. And I know that when I come out of the stem cell transplant out the other side, that's when the healing can commence because the medical model does not deal with healing. The medical model deals with killing cancer. So that's where I'm at. Now, you're in a different place, aren't you? Yes, I, I guess so, because that the the physical um, treatment for me, apart from a bit of medication, is for now over. Um but I, I would really, that that in itself is such an interesting thing. And, I, and I've spoken to people about it and I've read about it. And it's this concept that once your treatment's finished, that's great. You're over, you're better. And it's so not, so not the case. Absolutely not. You know, when, <laughs> when I finished the radiotherapy, actually the medical model did say to me, look, this will continue to build. And, you know, you'll be at your peak probably about two or three weeks after the treatment. So with all my incredible friends who took me to the hospital every day and it was wonderful, the the real work and, and the real effects of it just started to kick in once everybody had kind of gone home and got in with their life. And I think that's really significant because um, we'll talk more about this tomorrow, but it, it does integrate that sense of grief in so on so many levels and grief just isn't all about somebody dying it's about the loss of something um and that's oh what emotion... when you said that you know you were this busy busy person and you were doing your thing that was like me I was like traveling the world and I was living my best life and I was running my business and you know and I was just kind of I felt so sideswiped I literally it was like someone just whew, took the hit me on the knees and I fell to the ground. It was kind of like that. Yeah. It, it's like life will never be the same again, mm. ever. Um, and I think what everybody um, is deep, deep down aware of is that none of us were promised a life free of suffering. Mm. None of us were. And all of us at some stage are going to fall apart in our lives. Um, more than once, maybe. Perhaps more than <laughs> once. Definitely more than one. <laughs> um, so the more we can understand our emotional world and how to take care of ourselves physically and nurture ourselves, and that is going to look different for everybody. But I almost see it like cradling ourselves in some sense. Um, and in the world of 
of um, good nutrition, of how we look after us, our body, the self-care, how we look after our physical, you know, our physical body through exercise and food. Um, for some, it's really going to affect their relationships and sex and fertility. That's a big one. Um, and then there's, you know, how do you rest? I've really had to look at how I rest and what oh does gosh. that look like? I've had to learn how to rest. Like really, like my body has, I mean, I say I've had to learn how to rest. Like I've, I've done it, but my body has gone, no, you're now resting. This is what rest looks like. I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's, and I, the fatigue, it's the fatigue that I just really struggle. When you've been Tigger, and bouncing around and did you know I've had stamina and energy way beyond well what I've seen in most people a lot of people yeah you know and yeah. when you've been that person to then see why everyone else needs to rest a lot it's quite a shock yeah it's been quite a shock but I have to say I'm getting quite good at it are you I quite yeah I quite like it I quite like it and I I like the fact that I have a reason for it I think it would have been really difficult to do it without a reason and that in itself needs unpicking doesn't it you know why do we, why do we <laughs> need all needs the rest you know it's just like <laughs> oh my god but yeah I I'm really get I'm really getting into the swing of rest and not yeah having one thing I wanted to ask you about, actually, was within the arena of let's start at the body and self-care and the physical, you know, there's there's so much um, support around physical. Um, I'm going to end this with what my arena, which is spirituality and energy and that sort of thing. But a big one is the change of appearance. Mm. Yeah, I mean, look, it's huge and well, anyone who's watching on YouTube can see that I'm wearing a turban because I don't have any hair. I did a lovely little video on Instagram that just got so much support. I put it onto um, LinkedIn as well, where I took my turban off and showed my bare head. And, you know, that's been a journey because I knew this was coming from day one. And that's a journey. But what's been really interesting, I think, is Do you know, I'm not sure I've processed yet, but there's something about stripping right back, just stripping right back to having no hair. On the end of that video, I just said, this is me. And so many people wrote back to me with a hashtag, this is me and a hashtag. And I just thought, you know, maybe, maybe there's something in that for everybody that actually we spend so much energy on having our hair and 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 makeup and you know the way the way we look is really important in in society isn't it and we yeah. might not even know that we spend that much time on ourselves and i've also had to put some weight on i can't remember if i said this in the last podcast maybe yeah you did yeah it's a, it's and so a, your body to be able to cope with the yeah so yeah. both of those things are quite confronting mm. um but yet there's something very light about both literally things. literally mm -hmm. um there's an expression of within that i've got other things that i'm going to focus on okay right now. i think there's an expression of rawness there's an expression of vulnerability and I'm, when I say vulnerability, I mean vulnerability as strength. It's very interesting. What about you? Because you have had, you've had a very different cancer to me. And so you've had physical changes too. I have. Yeah, I have. So I had a mastectomy on my right side. Um, and one of the one of the interesting things at the beginning was all the information about what to do. So there are three options, basically. You get stripped of nothing, so so they take everything. Or you can um, have an implant, which they have to do at the same time that they do the mastectomy. Um, or you can take um, 
material, flab, whatever you want to call it, um, from another part of your body. Um, I, I have really struggled with that. I had an implant. I have really struggled with it, um, partly because I just... I have this thing about everything being natural. You know, I talked about all my clean chemicals and stuff and I really love things. Just, I'm a purist with photography. You know, I like things stripped back. I just want to see it how it is. Um, and that actually is a big part of the therapy that I've been through is literally embracing this new foreign body into my body. And it feels different. I mean, the surgeon has done the most insane job. It looks amazing. Um, not quite yet, but it's still you bruised. Got one it... like amazing breast and one aged <laughs> no. breast. No, <laughs> no, I haven't. It's amazing because they look so similar. And I'm a, I'm a woman of a certain age. So it's not like, let's just put these on. <laughs> you don't want one perky breast yeah. and one not so perky no. breast, do you? But, but I really struggled with it emotionally I just did um I struggled with the feel of it I'm still doing exercise because it it's still not completely adhered to the chest wall um but that's the bit my, the change in appearance for me and and yet you know nobody would even notice you get some amazing prosthetics and stuff but I'm just reverting back to the the difficult bit that I found now you know I've done, done some work on really kind of embracing it and you know body body justification and all that kind of yeah I've, I've done a lot of stuff on it it I, but I can't exercise at the moment so my body does not feel strong and I've always had a really strong body um and that will come and then with regard to sex and relationships I'm not in a relationship at the moment but that is something that I've looked at you know I I, I don't see myself being single for the rest of my life but that is something that I will potentially deal with when the time comes. Um, and I didn't lose sleep over it, but it was just, I wasn't expecting that, you know? And there's things, because I have never, you know, dieted a lot. I don't I really ever wear makeup. I'm, I'm not that person. Um, and it was so interesting about how absolutely vulnerable, but also I beat myself up a little bit about not being really having a you know being more god my body's beautiful god I'm so lucky you know I've got my health and that sort of thing so I went through a little bit of that and that was self-criticism really that I hadn't done enough because now one side is is completely natural and then the other side is man-made but it's you know I, I've done a lot of soul searching about balancing that out and embracing everything in an equal measure yeah I mean I was just thinking there about that kind of body work that body acceptance that body love that body nurture and just thinking about really that's work that we all should be doing you know really embracing our bodies and being connected to our bodies um I mean we're we're of um you know we're both of a particular age we're certainly both on the well on the other side of menopause as well oh yeah um, absolutely and I and I I the menopause wasn't particularly horrendous for me but of course now I've been put back into menopause um with the medication I'm on quite a lot of menopausal symptoms but yeah and and I I really chose to go through menopause in the kind of wild woman way you know it was like let's strip this back i wasn't i was not wanting hrt at all whereas um, listener let me tell you i've had my patch on for years yeah there's <laughs> loads of change now around it and i didn't not want it because i thought it was going to give me breast cancer who knows maybe it did i, I don't know um but i ended up by taking um a wild yam cream which is a natural estrogen um because the medical model was actually it's quite interesting my my doctor when I called her and said look you know can I just explore this a little bit her comment to me was look Nikki you're 61 you've got no hormones you don't need a blood test let's just get on with it nothing and I was really shocked I was really shocked by that wow. um, so yeah that that was something that I yeah and then of course when you're led to other areas to have to explore it because 
you you don't find that support and i'm not i'm not generalizing this is a particular conversation i had with my doctor and um my, all my work as you know has been around energy mm. and that form of healing and spiritual space so i felt very comfortable about trusting myself and the the various things that i found online um and knowing that wherever this was going to take me it was going to take me for my highest good that's where i came from with it um but i also know how to clear energy you know i use i have tools i don't know how to clear it. i have tools that i use to help clear it because i look at the energy in hospitals you know the energy in your home the energy of other people you're around um and that is for me absolutely crucial you know th there is so much emotional stuck energy in hospitals where in you know in any public place Nikki let me tell you so where I go to so everybody I've met has been stunning in terms of because I'm I'm feeling the energy, but I'm also looking for all those relational cues. My work's around trauma-informed practice and relationship-focused practice. And so I'm really looking at all of those. Triage, I won't even go to, I won't even go to triage. Like I would have to be. So we have a system where if you if you're really poorly, you go to triage and they triage you. Essentially, they read a list like you're phoning 111 and ask you a set of questions. The staff turnover is high. I do a lot of work around organizational culture and going into that space, there is a problem with the organizational culture in there. So that's not my experience in the day units, not my experience with the people who are supporting me to do the stem cell transplant. So it's really interesting, isn't it? That there are different spaces and places and actually there are people who are so aligned with relational practice and trauma-informed practice who know nothing they say to me what do you do and I tell them they've never heard of what I do you know yeah. they just happen to have a team that understands that I need to feel physically safe psychologically safe that I need to have those visual cues that tell me that this is okay. I need those smiles. I need to be spoken to with my name. I don't like being shouted out across the corridor by my name. I don't have, I don't like people saying really loudly in front of everyone else. And your phone, what's your address and your date of birth, please? These are private things. And you're obviously, you're asked them all the time. And so there's all those kind of things that you're navigating as well as trying to hold on to some kind of wellness and boundaries, you know, like they want to weigh you all the time. So every, I let them weigh me, I don't know, every kind of six times they ask. The rest of the time I say, I haven't eaten lots more cake. I'm probably what I was last week. No, thank you. And they are very respectful about that, but... There's something in that as well, this continuing of weighing you and, oh. So there's a, there's a lot of that to navigate as well as that, that intuitive stuff of what you feel when you go into those spaces, the mm. energy stuff that you're talking about. Please talk more on that. Well, my understanding of... Um when we have any sort of traumatic event or even just uncomfortable event your energy shifts so i come from a rule a school of thought that actually boiled down to nothing we are just energy we are electromagnetic beings it's how we relate it's how we get drawn to places it's how we get drawn to everything that's around us because we align with whatever that energy is of other people and when something really dramatic happens my sense is that your energy actually lifts out of your body. So you're not what I call grounded. So you're not feeling safe and stable and all that um, foundational stuff that allows your nervous system to relax and, and be in a, in a, in a, Rest in a good homeostasis, if you like. Yes. Um, so when you have this and your energy sort of sort of leaves your body, you feel lighter, you feel happy, you feel jolly, you feel amazing. Um, but when this happens, 
it, it's a bit like grief, actually. I, I find when people um, initially are bereaved, obviously, you know, and when you get a diagnosis, you're hugely nurtured. Suddenly this structure comes because you draw in people who are rescuers. So you draw in those people who, for their own well-being, need to support you and look after you. And, and then everybody's happy. You're, you're balancing each other's needs. But then reality hits and that's going to be a different time for everybody. So particularly in grief, it can be your, your energy starts to come back into your body as you go about your daily routine, which is why daily routine is so important um, to keep those normal things happening, to keep the normal practice and whatever that looks like. But um, but that means your body, then your energy goes back into your body. Now, depending on how self-conscious you or self-aware you've been about what what this has triggered for you in the form of change or you know you're going to change your food are you exercising more and most people with a diagnosis like this will change something and when that energy goes back into your body it feels different so that's why I feel people look different because their energy is different it left the body in shock and trauma it's now coming back into the body but sometimes, and I go back to post radiotherapy, when all that light stuff and comes around you, when that leaves, you're left with yourself. And this goes right back to the beginning of what we said. You know, everybody is going to have something that's going to fall apart in their life. And so looking after your energy and your emotional and, you know, energy and, and, getting those tools in place and understanding yourself, your coping mechanisms, how you view things, how you connect to different things, how you deal with fear, which we're going to look at tomorrow. Um, and even sort of decluttering your house so that things feel lighter. So it is as simple as that. You know, you go from being who you are and then your body leaves. You have your energy feels that sense. What does lightness feel like? Oh, my God, it's amazing. It's why people take drugs. It's why people drink is because they want their energy to leave their body. So they go off into a different space so they don't have to face reality. And that's really important to to get your head around in a way, because it is it's not rocket science. Um, it is simply how the energy in your body works. And this is why I think people who are dealing around trauma and nurses and all those those people in hospitals and stuff, the energy is different because there is never somebody who goes in and says, right, let's clear all this grief and trauma and anger and everything from this space. Do you ever want to take your sage into the hospital? Yes, <laughs> I really do. But more than anything, I would love to, for everybody who leaves the hospital to walk through like a sage archway yeah. and clear it because mm. or literally to march them to a patch of grass somewhere and say, right, take off your take off your shoes. Let's reconnect you like the plug. Let's earth you so your energy is not all over the place. And which goes back to when we first met. <laughs> it was my need to say, oh, my God, this girl, I, I want to earth her. I want to earth her. Um, and it would be so helpful for, for all these open spaces and, and to stop and then just go back into this breath and just let the energy calm down and lower. You know, it's why I do sound, because sound and, you know, earth and all these natural resources that we have all around us just remind us that actually we can connect with that at any time and really really care for ourselves it's amazing isn't it because the I mean I I haven't I haven't used the medical model before really I mean okay. yes I had HRT yes years ago I had contraception you know I've had my babies in hospital but in terms of relying on the medical model uh, to deal with my health is not is not really something that I've been I've had to do. I've been very health privileged. And I've always used holistic therapies for my mental and my physical health, if we have to separate them, but they're not separate, but we live in a culture that separates them. But they um, complement beautifully. Yeah. And that has always, you know, and that's where I will go back to when I move into my healing. I think my sadness about the medical model is 
that it can't really incorporate both. What you're describing is just not ever going to happen because it would just be, can you imagine somewhere that really understood all of those things, but actually what I've had to grasp and what I've had to come to terms with is that the medical model is going to be really, really good at killing this cancer in my body. It can't cure it because I don't have a curable cancer, but it can treat it. Um, and that I'm going to have to continue, which is also a privilege because it's not available on the NHS. I'm also going to have to deal with my healing when I come out of the other side, where I can go back to what I've always used to stay well and healthy, my kind of preventative health strategy. I mean, and that's the other thing. I mean, we talked about that a little bit, didn't we? You know, I have always been very responsible about my health. I haven't had a drink for many, many years, since 1990, not smoked for probably 20 years, don't eat processed food use holistic therapies to stay balanced and grounded and that does not stop certain illnesses but what I'm absolutely certain about is that my responses to the treatments have been so good because I arrived into this from a really healthy place and I'm so grateful for that but the incorporation of the medical model and what's called complementary model, um, I feel sad really that that's not something that we're likely to see. Well, it's interesting because there, I mean, I, I know of quite a few places around the world who deal very holistically with cancer but they don't necessarily engage in the medical model. It, it, we're still a little bit either or. Yes, yeah, that's, and, my, that's my sense, yeah. Yeah, you're right. However, um, and in a way, rightfully so, you know, it's very unregulated, the complementary in, in, in many ways. You mm. know, I know there's the complementary therapies association and there's Reiki association and all those things, but you don't have to join them. So there is a lot out there and there's a lot of incredibly, if you don't mind me saying, bonkers stuff around yeah. cancer, particularly, yeah. which can yeah, be is. very difficult to navigate. So I suppose as a disclaimer, what I'd say to people is just be really cautious, go for recommended people. Um, it's worth discussing with your cancer nurses just because sometimes they know quite a bit about uh, one of the cancer nurses at my surgery actually not at oncology is quite knowledgeable um around therapies and cancer um and most reputable therapists won't even treat you without a letter anyway from your um hematologist or from your oncologist or whatever cancer specialist you is looking after you so if you if someone doesn't ask you for that, then that's probably a bit of a warning sign as well, um, because the, there is a lot of um, noise, noise and nonsense. I think it would be fair to say, Nikki, would you say? Yes, but I would also add to that that a lot of hospitals now, particularly who have a strong oncology department, have a, a, a complementary centre next to them. You know, well, I you live, don't, but you in the, do, don't you? Yes. Well, there's yes in uh, Will Macmillan. You know, there's a lot of cancer charities who offer free complimentary. I go to a little one called Cancer Wise. I mean, Macmillan have uh, you know have a vast array of complimentary therapies available, um, from acupuncture, um, energy healing. I mean, I think um, certainly massage. And, and there's loads and loads of, there's a lovely it's a little workshop called Look Good, Feel Better. I've that, seen that, but I haven't yeah. been on it. But yeah, there's seen that so much. much. And I would just say to people, explore it. You know, even if you're not, haven't been diagnosed with cancer, you know, this is part of self-care and becoming self-aware. And, you know, we live in such a crazy world now where 
how do we know what's ever true at all? But what you can look after is that old serenity thing, isn't it? What you really can look after is yourself, your health and well-being and really learn about yourself and, and how you operate in the world. It's so freeing and it's so healthy for everybody to do that because, you know, there's probably not a day goes by that people on some level, something frustrates them or annoys them. You know, there's a lot of anger in the world. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's just worth whether you've had a diagnosis or not. Listen to some great music. You know, I'm in the world of sound now. This is about frequency. This is about, you know, uplifting and, and not being naively hugely positive all the time, but understanding, you know, a lot of it. And that is particularly in the younger generations. Now they are, you know, they're growing up with literally yoga being there every day, you know, meditation and 20 years ago, different world. It's it, a different it, world. it is a very different world and it's changing all the time. And I think I'm really excited actually about what everybody's exploring and the fact that we're getting back to nature triggered by the subject of climate change. I believe that is just the planet bringing us and drawing us closer to nature. It's like, you know, wake up. Are you noticing nature? You know, maybe who knows what climate change is, but I know but it is really helping everybody focus back to nature. Well, my research has found that, you know, several things in terms of overcoming adversity and, of course, connection with nature was in there. It's not rocket science. Yeah. But just going back to that sound frequency, when I was in a really dark place, mm. when I got the diagnosis, I had about six weeks where it was really not, not good, That's not good. good. I literally had healing sound frequencies on virtually 24 hours a day I just did not know what else to do other than have sound and for those of you not familiar with this you can literally type this into Google type it into Spotify type it into whatever healing frequency and you will get the frequency that you need I mean it's really funny because now I just can't listen to it I think I overdosed <laughs> on healing frequency sounds but yeah. I just found that because night and day were a blur because I wasn't sleeping because my ribs were broken and I was in yeah. so much pain. That was how I got through those each 24 hours um, was, was, was using sound. But listen, as we draw to a close, do you, do you have like three, I mean, I'm really not a top tips person, but you know, people listening might like to have three takeaways or, a takeaway that you'd like to give people before we close off? Self-love. Do you know, I was going to say that. I was totally going to say that. You do, you do, you do. <laughs> We're so spooky. <laughs> <laughs> self-love is absolutely. And self-love is what floats your boat, what makes your heart sing, what feeds your soul. I guess in my world, that's kind of the only thing that really matters. And we'll talk about death tomorrow because that's going to lead us brilliantly. Um, another one, I guess, would be, does it matter? Ask yourself, does it matter? And if it does, then do it. And if it doesn't, drop it. It's probably for somebody else. So don't get caught up in all this absolutely massive overload of information. Um, just sometimes take a step back and, and yeah, ride the wave. What can I say? Ride the wave because I do, I love the phrase, this too shall pass. So we've got. Self-love. Self-love, being discerning. And I think that's key. Absolutely key. Making that decision. Do I need to do this? Does it matter? Not? Does it matter? Does it matter? Yeah. If I do Does it matter to me? Yeah. Forget what everybody else. There'll be people telling you all sorts of things. Your nearest and dearest family, friends, doctors, nurses, whatever. To you, does it matter? Is it important? And then finally, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. That's because it does. Absolutely key. Absolutely key in the hold whole that. Cancer trip <laughs> yeah you know, when it's yeah. really difficult and that was something that I really struggled with when I was in a lot of pain because I just could not envisage a life 
not in pain anymore. And having the experience of the pain going and that it passed is really helping with me going into the stem cell transplant where I'm going to get poorly again. Can I just caveat that? Sorry to interrupt. Can I just caveat that bit to say this too shall pass, but look on that as each day. Each moment, Nikki. Because for those who are looking at terminal, yeah, it is going to pass, but that's a very, very deep, that's a very deep subject. And, and I don't necessarily feel we'll go there now, but that is that does lead us into your view on death and your fear and all that sort of thing. So I don't mean this too shall pass tritely because, you know, I am deemed at the moment to have come out and I don't have cancer anymore. I have no idea what's around the next corner for me, but I, I choose to hold that uh, mantra, this too shall pass. And I believe that the clock keeps ticking. You know, th the world spins. So we go around in circles, we go to rock bottom, but we have to then come back up to the top and it will keep. So however listeners want to um, explore that, I just wanted to put that caveat in. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to end with hashtag this is me. Shall I take my turban off for this for this last bit? There we go. Look at you. This is me. And it's oh. so beautiful. Thank you, darling. It's amazing. I'm I'm it blows my mind whenever I look at my face without hair. I just it's quite emotional, actually. I'm sure. Yeah. I feel emotional. I feel yeah. really emotional. Yeah. Hashtag this is me. Perfect. Take care and I'll speak to you soon. Yeah. Bless you.